when the angel came to Gideon and the angel says God is with thee thou mighty man of valor do you know what he did he turned to the angel and said do angels tell jokes what do you mean God is with us where are the miracles our fathers told us of you've gone to church for 20 years and never seen a miracle and it doesn't bother you I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Well, do you like the food here? Not very much. What's the hardest thing? I left my wife. We've been married less than two years. We have a baby six months old. I won't see my wife for two more years. I won't see my baby. But I'm going to be a boxer. He's so determined to do that. Now I read about these other fellows. All the energy they put in to obtain what Paul calls a corruptible crown. You know the trouble with our generation, we've lost sight of eternity. The things that are seen are temporal, the things that are not seen are eternal. And God takes this man and he says, go hide thyself. And he goes into a cave. What do you think he did? What did he do? I believe he prayed. Do you realize where this man is living? He's living right after the glorious days when the Shekinah, the glory of God, used to fill the temple and it's there no more. We don't see the Shekinah glory. Most of us don't even know what it is. We don't want it. We're happy to have little meetings. We're happy because we don't drink and smoke and swear and do some lousy things. But where are the God-filled men? Have you felt the burden? And if you haven't, why haven't you? Are you concerned about the situation? Have you got a zeal for the glory of God? Does it grieve you to see his church as she is? If not, why not? If this is a burden that can come to anybody, why hasn't it come to you? As a little boy, I'd go into the garden. We had a flower garden, as we say in England, a vegetable garden. And uh, I'd try and pick up a bucket of potatoes, and I'd strain, and Dad'd say, put it down, you'll hurt your back. When I got to be about 13, I'd go in, I'd see half a bucket, and I'd pick that up and carry the half bucket. Father, put it down, you carry the full one, you're strong enough to carry it now. If God Almighty only gives us strength or burdens equal to our strength, we'll be in a bad way. What we need is, is strength for the burdens on this day. I... My dear friend, listen. The forces of evil are crowding on full pressure today and there's a spiritual warfare which will never cease until time runs out and the church of Jesus Christ has got all the equipment all the buildings all the plants all the method, all the theory, and all the technique, but no power to move men to God. And I say that to my own heart. We've never been so well equipped, but so lacking in endowment. Now, for this, each one of us is personally responsible. is where the presence is pregnant with deity and people move out and they don't talk when they leave and they don't light up cigarettes they know they want God I submit to you that we can't longer go on waiting for the recalcitrant and the indifferent and the stubborn the time has come when those who are of one mind and one heart must begin to meet on the grounds of the Lord's being. How will it be? Are you prepared to give a night of your life above all the other responsibilities you have? If you can't give a night, are you prepared to meet at five in the morning for two hours or more? 
Are you prepared to expend effort and energy and sacrifice of your time? I believe that the that which will save America is not going to be the great crusade as important as that has been, the great church as significant as that is. But it's going to be the cell of groups of people that have been drawn by a commitment to Christ and spread spontaneously and move out. Beloved, you'd better learn how to worship alone and quiet because it may come before you're many years older than you if you worship at all. The greatest revival in the world right now is amongst the Muslims. Why? Because they're prepared to die. You can't scare them. We're prepared to die. Our folk are not prepared to live. Sure, they'll come to a camp, they think, ride horses or have, uh, play tennis or some other thing. I know there's nothing wrong in that. But where's the passion? It's young men that see vision. I'm not trying to escape it. I want to tell you for God, I'm in my 83rd year now. I have a bigger fire burning in my belly, if you like, of my heart than ever in my life. And I'm determined by the grace of God to wage war. <clears throat> Don't let any man take your crown. God has given you a job, do it if you die. That's what it takes. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I will say, it is to wage war by sea, land and air, with all our might, and with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. Let that be realized. Down. Oh yes, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. But between here and there, there's a thousand pitfalls. For some of you fellows, a pair of sparkling eyes. For some of you girls, a very promising young man. There's going to be a great preacher and God wants you to burn your life out somewhere else. For some of you just to be godly fathers and mothers, there's an awful scarcity of them right now. It says a hymn writer, along my sinful heart was striving to obtain his promised rest. But when all my struggles ended, simply trusting, I was blessed. If you come to this altar this morning, I'm going to ask you to come for one thing, because all I know about an altar is for two things. Then, or in the Old Testament, for sacrifice and for death. I could take you to the place where I knelt once, when I was about 18. Considered to be the youth leader of the church, and we'd seen some souls saved. I got the youth to meet on a Friday night at 7 o'clock, we prayed till 9, I got them to preach, to, to, to meet at 6 o'clock, Sunday morning, and, and we prayed. I went out in Sherwood Forest and prayed by myself. Weep and groan because I'd read David Brainerd. He did it and I didn't know any better and I'm glad I did it. I'm not embarrassed. Nobody else showed me a pattern. I sometimes think God sent me back to America for what I learned out of that one brief abridged book of David Brainerd. A man that died at 28 years of age, burned out for God. Broken, weeping. What General Vagon has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward 
into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. So bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour.